because we know that maybe we're not living up to it. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority on heaven and earth is given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I will be with you always to the very end of the age. The church at its best is not satisfied with status quo. The church is, at its best is not satisfied just to know that their relationship with God is good and their faith in Christ is genuine and their experience with the Holy Spirit is up to date and they are, are, are uh, living a good and righteous life. They are living the kind of life that they feel like and believe that God would be pleased with. But there is an inner compulsion in the church at its best that this news must be shared. Paul describes it this way in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 27. He said, Yet when I preach the gospel, I cannot boast, for I am compelled to preach. In fact, he goes on to say, Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. I am compelled, he says. The church at its best is compelled to tell everyone that Jesus is real, that he loves them, and that he desires to live forever in them and with them. But what motivates our acceptance of the mandate? Well, there are several motivating factors that sometimes... cause us to accept the mandate. One motivating factor is guilt. I should do thus and thus, and therefore I will. Now guilt, for a short period of time, is a powerful motivator. We've all lived with shoulds and oughts all of our lives. And you and I know what it is to uh, know it is to do something out of a feeling of guilt. It may be something in our home. It may be something at work. Oh, I really should do this. I feel guilty because I'm not doing it. Sometimes that that uh, motivation still uh, that form of motivation spills over into our work for God, into our life in Christ. So I should do this. Therefore, I will. But guilt only takes you so far. Because, you see, after a while, after a while guilt loses its, its, uh, its effectiveness. And we begin to say, well, so what? There's another one, motivation, that's called duty. Duty. The job needs to be done, so I guess I'll do it. And you've all sat around, uh, you've sat around uh, uh, tables and and, 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 and chairs, and maybe again at, at work or at home or in other organizations or within the church. But you know what? This job needs to be done. I guess I'll do it because there's nobody else, or there doesn't seem to be anyone else. Now all of us will do things out of duty. We go to work many times out of a sense of duty because we're supposed to be there. And duty lasts a little bit longer, though it's not a whole lot better than guilt. Duty will keep us at a a, a task for a little while longer than guilt will simply because we're honorable people and we desire to do what needs to be done. Well, let me suggest a third motivation. I want you to consider the motivation of love. You already got there. 
You knew that's where I was coming from. Or that you knew that's where I was headed. Motivation, first of all, for Christ and, and what he has done. You know, we, we return love to those who love us. Isn't this true with Christ? You know, what is it? I, I would imagine that if you talk to this pastor who month after month after month picks up his arrest ticket and stores it away, waiting for the day that he can go to the government authorities and say, hey, I'm official now. I want to be official now. What would you think he'd say? He'd say, oh, you know what? Jesus is so good to me that I can't help but go through all this because I know he loves me and I love him for what he has done in me and for me. How my life has changed. You see, he puts his love in us. William Greathouse says that holiness is a fulfillment of the Old Testament command to love. Holiness is the fulfillment of the Old Testament command to love. And it's not a gritting our teeth kind of thing. It's love. You see, when, when Christ moves in, sin and hatred moves out. And I know that video that we saw earlier this morning was a dramatization. But I'm certainly it was a dramatization upon real life situations. And I think of that little boy, or that young man, actually, it wasn't a little boy, but that young man who was eating his lunch with the pastor's family, and he took part of the banana and ran to the garbage pile that he and his other buddy had been pilfering through. And his other buddy reacted initially with fear. He said, what, what, what's he doing? And they shared a banana with him. I'm sure they'd had their share of fights over chips, over scraps of meat, over rotten potatoes. But here love was holding out a banana. You see, when Jesus moves in, when he moves in, sin and hatred move out because they cannot coexist. We tried a long time to coexist with communist Soviet Union, and it just doesn't happen. It doesn't happen with Christ either. Christ and sin cannot coexist. But, but you see, love makes the work easier. Somehow, when we, when we do our work out of love, it's just easier. You've had people that you have worked for, you've had bosses, who it seemed like that they couldn't wait until you made a mistake so that they could yell at you. And for a long time, from what I understand, uh, what little bit I understand of, 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 of business and, and economics and, and, all, and, and labor and all that, that seemed to be kind of the way that the system worked for a number of years. There was kind of a sense that the, that the foreman was there to make sure that you didn't mess up. And when you did mess up, because you knew, he knew you were going to, he, he motivated you through either a scolding or a written up or whatever it was. And you responded in kind. But transfer that sense of work over to a sense of respect, even admiration for the one whom you're working for. And it changes the whole equation. It changes it all. Work becomes easier. Love makes work easier. And love will continue to motivate us long after guilt and duty dry up. Love will continue to motivate us long after guilt and duty dry up. 
Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14. Paul writes, For Christ's love compels us, because we are convinced that one died and for all, and therefore all died. And he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. Christ's love compels us. But what happens when love fades? What happens when it seems like what we're doing is duty? Or it seems like that guilt begins to motivate us once again. Returning back to that retired General Superintendent Orville Jenkins on that, I believe it was a Tuesday morning at that General Assembly, he said, pray through. He said, when revival starts in my heart, then I can rise above what can hinder. When revival starts in my heart, then I can rise above what will hinder. And we seek a greater measure of Christ's love by seeking Him. It's not a grit your teeth kind of thing. I'm going to do what I do out of love even if it kills me. No. It's a seeking Jesus. Lord, I'm in trouble here. I need your help. Once again, once again, would you kindle that love, that love for you that remembers where I was, that remembers, where, where, that, that, that thinks about where I could have been if it wasn't for you? Would you rekindle that love? You see, love will sustain us and it'll keep us moving out. It'll sustain us and it'll keep us moving. It'll keep us going. It'll keep us calling. It'll keep us praying. It'll keep us uh, full of compassion when compassion seems to be, would, would seem to be gone. Love will sustain us and keep us moving forward. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 7 through 12, Paul writes, but we have this treasure in jars of clay. You all know what jars of clay are, don't you? They're imperfect. They are breakable. They get worn out. He says we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. The motivation that we have is from God. It's not from us. He says we are hard pressed on every side, but not crushed. We are perplexed. You ever been perplexed? But not in despair. We're persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. For we who are alive are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake so that His life may be revealed in our mortal body. So then death, death is at work in us, but life is at work in you. The kingdom work is our task. There is no plan B. And so let our love for Christ, our love for the world, that we are called to win. Let that love overcome the things that would make us apathetic or would hinder our work. Would you stand with me, please?